As I said this morning, I'm going to continue what I started last Sunday morning in a series of studies on fellowship. I want to deal with the fundamentals of that and systematically set forth before us what we all need to know that the Bible teaches about it. Last week, we got into the study of God's law of inclusion. We spent the whole sermon on those matters and matters related thereto. And today I want to get into what will take up the rest of the time, and I'm not quite sure how far into the future we'll go with this. I don't quite know how to measure it. But uh, we will begin to look at what constitutes God's law of exclusion. God's law of exclusion. I do want to say this, and I probably should have said it last week, and that is I do not know how to say when I was a young preacher trying to get my feet on the ground and understand all that I could about the right division of the word and the principles of ascertaining Bible authority, how much I owe to several older preachers who were so good at teaching. And I don't know how really to say more than I thank God that I was exposed to their teaching when I was a young man, even as a boy. And it's certainly the case when it comes to what the New Testament teaches about fellowship. Now, instead of stating God's law of exclusion at this given point in our general study, first of all, I want us to have certain biblical evidence given that relates to that law. And this is one reason I'm not quite sure how far we'll go because I want to be studying with you several different passages from the Bible that gives us what we need to know so the law can be formulated. And uh, before beginning the study, which of course will lead, I trust, to the formation of that law to understand how it is formed, it'll be good to remind ourselves of certain important facts related to the general discussion of fellowship. Let me remind you that men sin and they're separated from God and thus they're out of fellowship with God and being in that state when they die, they're lost. It's certainly not God's fault that we're out of fellowship with Him, but the fault needs to be put where it truly belongs and that's upon man. Men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Thus God in infinite mercy has provided a way for us to be forgiven of our sins and thereby reconciled to him and come into great fellowship with him a fellowship that Adam and Eve knew before they sinned and a fellowship we want to participate in and remain in thus the study last week of God's law of inclusion that law of inclusion simply means he has a plan that allows for us to be saved by him through Christ to benefit from what Christ did for us we never could do for ourselves in the sinless life he lived, the sacrifice of himself upon the cross for us, the shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins, and how we can contact that blood and be saved by the power of the blood. How that we were added by the Lord to the church, thus baptized into Christ, and thus in fellowship with God. Now we're looking at the other side of the coin. And that is, as you study the scriptures, there is a law of exclusion. So we remind ourselves that God loves all men. We must never forget that. In our dealings one with another and with those outside of Christ who need the gospel, as we sang a minute ago. We need to understand that he wants all men to be saved from their sins, be faithful to him on earth of the church, and to go to heaven. That is his desire. An array of scriptures, such as we'll, we'll begin with John 3, 16, Titus 2, 11, and so many others, Hebrews 2 and verse 9. In fact, you could say in general, the fact that we have God communicating with us in the Bible, that within itself says he loves us. And as he made us, he wants to us to understand our lost condition, that he loves us and gave us the way of salvation and the gospel plan. And he wants us to study it, know it, and humbly obey it. So God's love is universal. Not only does God love all men, but it is His will 
as Christians, members of the church, you've heard the gospel, believed and obeyed it, added to the church by the Lord himself, that we should love all men and sincerely desire their salvation. When you think of everything Christ did, how he prepared the apostles, as this account is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you see the book of Acts as the church is started in Acts 2, it all has to do with the church being the instrument through which the gospel is preached. And we sing that song, into our hands the gospel is given. God cannot, and this sounds very strange, but the way he ordained it, God cannot get done what he really wants done if the spiritual body of Christ, members in particular, do not comply with his will that the gospel be taught to every creature. Uh, to every creature on this earth. That is meaning every person who needs it, who's capable of understanding it. Sometimes we don't realize that. But we are to be living before the world like the New Testament says, and a part of that is preparing ourselves to preach the gospel and defend the faith, and in that way enlighten people along that line. But we as Christians must love all men as God loved them and sincerely desire their salvation. Whatever we do, in the church, it's enjoined on us to be faithful. We must not forget the need to sound out the gospel, to use every means possible to try to reach people with the gospel. So we should love all men. We should understand, we can spend a lot of time on that, what it means to love men in their sins. And it means just what it means when God loves people in their sins. The message we preach is to come out of those sins, of repentance, having believed in Christ, and to confess one's faith in Christ and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. We should also note that the Bible upholds unity. Some of this is a repeat of last week. By that, we mean the Bible upholds unity, which is brought about by obedience to God's Word. God has a platform of unity. There are seven divine planks in it. Paul lists them in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. You can find his desire for unity in such passages as that and in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, and we're very familiar with 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And he condemns division. That is, division that is condemned by his word, which is a division brought about by false doctrine or allegiance to human personalities. Over and over again, one way or another, we are warned in the New Testament not to follow the commandments and doctrines of men. That even how the teachers of error will approach us by good words and fair speeches, when in reality their desire is to destroy us, Romans 16, 17, and 18. I don't think anyone here or anyone who's knowledgeable of the Bible would say anybody ever did any more to spread the gospel to those outside the church, the alien sinner, than did the Apostle Paul. Yet, I don't think he, uh, anyone could say that they could outdo him when it came to him dealing with false teachers in the church. I've never understood seemingly how some of my brethren have felt about the matter, that all we need to do is try to convert the alien sinner. But not enough of that goes on, I admit. Not enough members of the church are that zealous of lost souls. But when they do obey the gospel, do we forget about them? When most of the New Testament is written to members of the church to keep them faithful and to keep the church pure. So surely we're mindful that once they're saved from their alien sins and they're Christians, we want to see them remain faithful and saved and get to heaven. And that means they must abide in the doctrine of Christ. It should be noted that while God upholds unity, as an ideal, and we mentioned the kind of unity that is. He does not uphold all unity. I'm bringing that out because over the last more than 50 years in the church, so many have said, well, really, if you just believe in God and the Christ, the Son of God, and the need of Christ to save you, anything else doesn't make any difference. We can all be unified on our belief in Christ as the Son of God. If you want to use mechanical instruments of music and worship, that's nothing to fall out about. You may strongly disagree with it. You may strongly uphold it. If you want to take of the Lord's Supper, 
once a month or once a quarter, well, you may strongly disagree with that, and you may uh, uphold it, and so on and on you can go. But if you believe in Jesus and claimed Him as your Savior, we can all unify in that. We should let none of these things separate us. That, of course, and I may mention this later, led to the view that was espoused by Carl Ketcherside, the late Carl Ketcherside, beginning in the late 50s and the 60s, when not many in the church gave any attention to him whatsoever. But Ketcherside and some of those very early ones, like Leroy Garrett, who was his partner, were very tenacious and steadfast in preaching their doctrine. And they basically came up with what they called gospel and doctrine. We're united in gospel, but we can be divided in doctrine and stay, re, un, and stay united in uh, gospel. Well, the Bible makes no such distinction. That is, doctrine and gospel and gospel and doctrine and the faith and so forth are all saying the same thing. It all is the will of God being preached. Some of it applies to those outside of Christ, how they're to be included. Others applies to members of the church as to how that they live the Christian life. So we need to be mindful that that's one of the things that at one point when I was a young man and for a while thereafter was a big to-do in the church. Nowadays you don't even think about it anymore because it's permeated most of the churches. And you have a whole host of people who are not, un they're just unwilling to say that the pious unimmersed are lost. Well, we shouldn't say it if the Bible says they're not. But that means we don't understand God's law of inclusion and the plan of salvation. Nobody's going to be saved that does not from the heart obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, and 18. And that is being buried with Christ in baptism because you're a believer and repented of your sins and confessed your faith in Christ. And thus, you complete your obedience by being baptized into Christ. And further, while it's certainly true that God condemns division he does not condemn all division rather he upholds some division he makes it clear that Christians cannot have such an association with the world that they would be influenced by the world we have statements of coming out from among them and be you separate and touch not the unclean thing that is in those matters necessary to being faithful to God we cannot cross and leave those things. We must understand that God expects us to separate ourselves from them. I don't know how anybody can read about fleshly Israel and how God over and over and over again punished them for their lack of pulling themselves away as a fleshly nation from the other nations round about them. And they got themselves into big trouble when they wanted a king, and the reason was to be like the nations round about them. Now, all that was written before time for our learning. Well, what does it teach me today when it comes to the spiritual body of Christ, the kingdom? It teaches me the allurements to be like false religions round about us because they sort of favor us. We believe a whole lot of the same things. We'll be there. I want to be accepted. That's what it comes down to. I want to be accepted. I remember Brother Warren saying one time that the theologians, THDs, DDs, are led around by the nose by the philosophers because they have the attitude is we've got to follow them because in academia the philosophers consider to be a step up from the others and so they don't want to do anything that would make them look like they're in opposition to the PhD in philosophy so they adopt the philosophical views into their theological views and therefore they're all accepted and I don't doubt that that's the case we're all like that to a great extent we like to go along with our peers and that's always been something that we've been warned against. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Well, I suggest to you that when it comes to matters of religion concerning God and Christ and the Bible, that the multitude is not acceptable to God. I don't know where we can't see just by casual reading of the whole Bible, anywhere you want to go, 
that God has never said that simply because you're in the majority, you're acceptable to me. That sure would make a big difference in the way the matter of Noah and his family being saved from the flood because he saved the minority of a minority of a minority of a minority and the majority couldn't swim. And it's been that way. And the emphasis is be right. Right with God. Be obedient to God. That's what's always emphasized. Doesn't make any difference to everybody else. It is not. You can be. And every example you have in Hebrews 11 and throughout the Old Testament of people who were acceptable to God were people who did what was right when it wasn't the popular thing to do. Even among their own people. The Israelites, as they sinned, then there would be somebody, especially in the days of the judges, raised up who was unlike the people round about and would judge Israel. Do we get anything out of those lessons? Well, we ought to. And it ought to be the one that really stands out about David as he looked at Goliath. You know, as he looked at Goliath, he had to also see King Saul and the armies of Israel cowering in their tents. And who was he to stand there and say, well, who is this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, defying the armies of the living God? He didn't have anything to prove to anybody. He just knew what God said concerning what was right and wrong. And he said, let's do it. That's the way it ought to be for every one of us who's members of the church. We need to be concerned about general and specific authority. When we speak of general authority, we can't make it more specific than what the words generalize. If I say go into the spring church house. Well, that's specific in the sense of the spring church house, if that gives you enough information to know where you're to go. But I didn't tell you how to go or when to go or which door to enter into. I didn't tell you even to come into the auditorium or go into the classrooms. So that left up to your judgment, isn't it? But if I told you to go in the front door of the spring church house that enters into the back of the auditorium and go down to the third pew from the front on the right side of the building and pick up a song book. Now, do you see the difference in the first one being general and the second one being far more specific? Well, when I'm looking for authority from my Lord in the words of my Lord, I have to understand some things are general. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's quite general. Go where? In all the world? Preach. Preach what? Preach the gospel to who? To every creature. It doesn't tell me where to go first. It doesn't tell me uh, who to preach it to or where I'm going to. As long as it's in the world and the people who need it. So we need to understand that. That's just first principle of right division of the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. So we must neither treat general authority as if, we were, if it were specific, nor treat specific authority as if it were general. Closely connected with this point that we just just made we should also note that there are matters of liberty this allows the exercise of the human judgment God has given us we do that with ourselves personally we do that within our homes as God has ordained the home and its structure we do that in the church in the way God's organized the church and we need to realize that where there is an obligation, there's always going to be options and thus liberty to choose which option that best discharges the obligation. The desires to discharge the obligation. That's it. When you look at the directions given to Noah and the building of the ark, there are some specifics right there. Yet there's a host of things not mentioned that was left to his judgments how he put all that ark together. And that's the way it is in virtually everything that God's obligated us to do that must not be changed, it must not be added to, altered, or modified, or taken away from, and all of it. We must neither treat matters of obligation if they were matters of liberty, 
nor treat matters of liberty if they were matters of obligation. And that's caused as many problems in the Lord's church as you can shake a stick at over all these years because people will not tell the difference. Either that or they just want something done their way and they wouldn't tell the church before getting it. So we must, if we're serious about taking the Bible as the very word of God, to communicate the will of heaven to us so we'll know how to be pleasing to God when we learn it, then we will have to take into consideration general authority and specific authority and matters of obligation and matters of liberty in choosing the best way to carry out only what God said that we must do. That's where we ran into the trouble in the 19th century when it came to is mechanical instruments of music authorized by God or are they not? Well, some said we're at liberty to use them. Others pointed out everything in the New Testament regarding music pertaining to worshiping God is seen, and we can't go beyond seeing. And then he even tells us Psalms, hymns, and spiritual song. So that even limits us further as to singing in worship to God to use Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He didn't say come together before the Lord's Supper, sing Little Joe the Wrangler. He didn't say that. So we need to understand what a psalm and a hymn and a spiritual song is because those are to be used according to God to praise Him in music, which music is designated, specified, singing. Now to do more than that is to do more than the Lord told us to do. It's to add to the Word of God. So Bible authority is something we're concerned about. Now I'm going to pause here and say, you folks have had the blessing of hearing all of that, not just from me, but from Al Brown, and I don't know who others. But you've heard a lot of it from me. But I promise you, as surely as you're looking at me and I'm looking at you, there are a host of congregations that have not heard what I've been speaking last week and today in a long, long time. They just haven't. And the sad part about it is some of the material that I got came from college lectureships back when I was young that you won't hear this preached on those lectureships today. They were then, but they won't be preached now. Well, what was the truth then on these matters is the truth now. There may be fewer people believing it and preaching it and upholding it and living it, but it's still the truth. God never did say if you've got a million people, then it's the truth. But if you only have a hundred, it's not. So it's not dependent upon that. Local churches, and by that I mean the congregation in the local area like this one, has allowed, God has allowed, I should put it that way, God has allowed these local churches and geographic locations the exercise of human judgment in certain matters. Now when you see the organization of the church, the elders, their qualifications, the work the Bible sets out for them to do for a congregation, the elders are expected in shepherding the flock and caring for the congregation to collectively de determine what the options will be that we use to carry out what the obligation of the church is. Just the way it works. That's been fought over. I remember very well. In 1977, Rule Lemons, as that firm foundation began to apostatize before it was sold, and now it's not even published, came out with an article called uh, Who Calls the Shots, in which he was indicating elders did not have the final say. Well, that fit right perfectly into all these unity and diversity people, liberals, because if you can get where the elders don't have the final say, then you do pretty much what you want to in the church, by majority rule. And he wrote that. Now, I took all one afternoon in my office in the church building in Muskogee to go back through a whole host it was all afternoon of old firm foundations. And I'll tell you why. It was already said by a number of preachers, and I just wanted to see if it could possibly be so, and I could prove it, that uh, Rubel was good at writing on both sides of an issue. So I sat down on the floor, and I went all the way back to before he became editor, and I think it was 1955. And I looked at several things, several papers before then, and I found that the editor of the foundation before him had read an article by him in which he very plainly pointed out the New Testament teachings that the elders had the final say-so in matters of option. Well, he was appointed editor a year or so later. Guess what he did? 
he used that same article and ran it as an editorial. But then he comes down here some 20 some odd years later and writes right the opposite. I took that article. I took his 77 article. I put them side by side in the bulletin and ran them with my comments. Somebody, I'm not sure who, sent the copy of that bulletin to Rule Limits. And I got the most interesting, lengthy letter back from him telling me how terrible it was that I would not accept the whole of the paper simply because there was an article two I didn't like. Well, I like to think I want to like those things that the Bible teaches, and I don't want to like those things the Bible doesn't. I want to support what the Bible teaches. I want to oppose what it does not. And I still have all that stuff. So, you know, as Brother Wallace said long years ago and in debate, oh, that my opponent hath written the book. Because nine times out of ten, they'll contradict themselves. And he did. But at that time, what made that so interesting? What made that so important about that? Because the disposition in the 1970s and the late 60s was all these people running around. It was all in the colleges, whatever, trying to say, well, if you believe in Jesus, that's what Catcher Side had said. Now by then, Rubel Shelley and those men had picked it all up, and you just got to unite on gospel, and you don't have to unite on doctrine. And guess what? They love that kind of thing. And then what do we have happening long about 2000 the first time? Somebody pops up and says that we have to reevaluate elders to see whether they still qualify. Now, I can't think of anything that people who want to be rebellious and contentious would want more than now the elders coming up ever so often to reevaluate them. Because there are always people who aren't going to like what elders are doing. I'm not trying to defend any elders who don't act like the Bible says they ought to act or are not qualified. Or they were qualified and then they become unqualified. There's a way to take care of that. The Bible teaches that too. But any time any group of people are in a position in any organization to have the final say sort of thing, there's going to be somebody under them, whether it's the public school or a business or whatever, that's not going to like the decision they make. Just not going to do it. And that's the reason that you have the simple statement that we're to submit to them to have the rule over us. Some people say, well, I do if it suits me. Submit means I really don't agree with it, but they're in the position to make the decision and I'm going to do what they say. You think you might in the military ever thought about that? Ever, ever had to submit? So we need to understand that when it comes to God who has ultimate authority, that he's delegated authority, that authority is in the word of God, and that there's general authority and there's specific authority, there's obligations, and then there's areas of liberty in carrying out those obligations. And that just as surely as people don't like those um, many or some decisions that elders make if you put any other group in whether they're qualified or not and they have the final say so you think everybody's going to like that and that's one reason they came up the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders you can just have a swinging door you get your chance at it every so often you put these folks out they serve their term we'll put these in now when you get so upset with them the majority can go against them you never find a scintilla of information in the New Testament that would uphold such a mess as that. If a person's qualified and appointed, he's qualified and appointed. If he's doing the work with the other elders because they all were qualified and appointed, then they're where they ought to be. They have the obligation to do it. They do it mindful of the fact Jesus is the chief shepherd. It's his church. They're overseeing and shepherding it as it's his church, not like they want to do. Not like their desire is. And so all of that fits in with people striving and serve as servants of Satan to pull the church away, to make it something it would not. And who was it that Paul say from among your own selves shall men arise teaching perverse things to draw away disciples after them? Why, well, he even said that to the Ephesian elders. So there has to always be each person measuring himself and measuring others. 
That's part of what fellowship's all about, folks, is that we keep one another straight. We joke about it sometimes and other things, but say we're here to keep one another honest. <laughs> Why do you always have, or at least I think most of the time, you have a written contract and everybody sign it? So it can be showed what you actually agreed to, and it's in writing. That's for honest people's own good, as much as to rule the crook out. All of that God knows, because after all, the New Testament is a last will and testament. That's where the will of the Lord's found. So we need to know the passages that put together God's law of exclusion. Now, I've got about enough time to go into the first passage. At least I think I do. But all of those things are very important in the fundamentals. In Matthew 18, 15 through 17, and I want to get this before you before we go any further. I have a passage here, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, that's been abused and misused by all sorts of folks. Now, it reads that if I'm... American Standard Version is what I'm reading out of. And if thy brother sin against thee. Now let that sink in. If thy brother sin against thee. Go, show him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he hear thee not, take with thee one or two more. That at the mouth of two witnesses or three, every word may be established. And if he refuse to hear them, tell it unto the church. And if he refuse to hear the church also, let him be unto thee as a Gentile and a publican. Is that really hard to understand? But people won't do it. I have seen people teach false doctrine publicly. Many of them supposedly very knowledgeable men. But then when they were answered as publicly as you could in view of the fact who knows where their doctrine went since it was taught publicly, especially in print, they squall louder than a stuck pig because you didn't come to them first, like Matthew 18, 15 through 17 says. I said notice those first few words because this is not dealing with a public matter at all. Where does it begin? If thy brother sin against thee. The person sinned against and the person did the sinning. Who knows about this? person sinned against and the person who did the sinning and of course God being omniscient knows all that's all and notice you go to him the one sinned against and you show his fault between thee and him alone does alone mean anything if people are what the Bible says they ought to be as brothers in the Lord it will be settled right there and nobody will have ever known about it. But the one offended and the one who did the offending and God who knows they settle matters like he said. It only goes beyond the two when the one who's the offender won't repent. Even then it doesn't go before the whole church. Notice that he says, If he hear thee, you've gained your brother. But if he hear thee not, take with thee one or two more. That's the divine prescription. You've been offended against. You've gone to him. He won't repent. You take one or two more because you want to verify exactly what the whole situation is. Now, if it is repented of then, not many people know about it. And if they're all what they ought to be as Christians, they're not going to say anything about it. But what if he doesn't repent? Only then is it put before the church so that every single solitary member of the church may go to the one at fault and hear multiplicity upon multiplicity of brethren sin? Because they don't. You know what it happens? An announcement is made. And that's the end of it. But that's not what it says. Now, if I were discussing over here with a denominationalist, I'd point out to him everything there is when a person, as to when a person became a Christian, the totality of the Bible on what is taught. This is very simple. 
Well, my brethren who get awful upset over Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians who just cannot understand the plan of salvation <laughs> evidently just cannot understand this. Here it begins in a private matter, if possible, it should end there. It gets a little bit more public if you can talk about three or four people knowing it, should end there. But to turn around and take this and say, I can teach false doctrine all over the world and spread it as far as I can, but you can't answer to me unless you follow Matthew 18. It rends the whole thing out of context. He's talking about a private matter, being remedied and kept as private as possible. And if it doesn't, uh, is not remedied there, it's to put before the whole church. Well, it can't be the worldwide church. It must be the way the church is organized, where the sin was committed, that is, where the brethren are members, and then there to come together. Why, some brethren would just soon be thrown in scalding water than to do what God requires of them. Well, they will be thought of as grand and good Christians, but they wouldn't go. And point that if they do, they apologize for what's being done to them. And that's a shame and disgrace that we wear the name Christian and we won't even do what our Lord said. If he refused to hear them, the two or three, tell it under the church. I was in a court case one time where I was giving witness, and because we had put this before the whole church. The fellow that was suing for a divorce, who was the fornicator, by the way, and his wife wasn't. She was suing him for a divorce as an innocent party. That was back in the days and such things were done. He was all up in arms because it had been put before the church. Now, he wasn't using Matthew 18 as it was supposed to be used. But I went to her attorney and just turned to him, Matthew 18. I said, here's what we're going by right here as far as putting him before the church. So he knew that. He's a Bible school teacher for years. He knew exactly. I said, he knows exactly. Well, guess what? They uh, asked him about this, and his lawyer stood up and opposed, said, let him read it and then explain to us what he thinks it means. Well, it didn't bother me at all because he was so dumb. He wouldn't use the Bible they had because it wasn't a King James Version. They had to recess court, look throughout the courthouse, find a King James Version. Then he came back and they gave it to him and he read it and he explained it better than I could. Now, I just went up to her lawyer and I said, there's no problem with that because in putting it for the church, he just admitted that's what he believed the passage teaches. Well, that put an end to that. Brethren, when people love sin, when they're in, caught up in sin, trying to defend it, lie about it, and this man had been doing this for years, finally was exposed, then there is no end to what they may say or not say. And then I suffice, why is that in your Bible? What do you learn from it? Ahab and Jezebel, what do you learn from those people? that they can be people who can think they're grand and wonderful folks and want you to think the same thing and they're rotten to the core. Main thing I want to come out of this and then the lesson's yours. One, personal offenses are sometimes committed. I think that's uh, obvious, one disciple against another. Two, when such occurs, the offended person's to go to the offender and explain the offense. Three, if the offender refuses to repent, then the offender is to take two or three others with him and again confront the offender. Number four, if the offender does not then repent, then the matter is to be taken for the whole church. And five, if the offender in the face of confrontation with the entire church remains impenitent, then the offender is to be no longer regarded as a faithful member of the church. J.W. McGarvey, in his commentary on Matthew and Mark, page 159, had this to say about that passage. In other words, when a man has sinned against his brother, refused to hear the church, refuses to hear the church, he is to be treated as we properly treat heathen men and publicans or men of wicked habits. 
We have known persons to express a doubt whether this implies an exclusion of the sinning party from the fellowship of the church. But to deny that it does would involve a great absurdity. It would require the offended party to live in the church with a man whom he justly treats as though he were a heathen and a publican. And it would require the church to hold in her fellowship men who are rightly so treated by her own members. Surely if heathen men and impenitent publicans are to be kept out of the church, disciples who deserve to be treated by their brethren as heathen and publican must be cut off from the church. Now that was written over well over 120 years ago. Well, that doesn't prove it right, but it proves that a great mind and a great many others who are wedded to the authority of the Scriptures and the infallibility and inspiration of the Scriptures have concluded some things that other people seem to be blind as a bat to. If you're not a Christian, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. There is a law of inclusion, and you've got to abide by it, or you won't become a Christian. If you have sinned and won't repent of it, there is a law of exclusion. First of all, if you are in sin and know it, you're already separated from God. If you died now, you'd be lost. It's that simple. There's no use trying to color it some other way. We need to understand that David prayed, keep me from presumptuous sins. In other words, I know this is what I ought to do. I know God said it, but I'm not doing it. That person can't expect the grace of God to cover anything. The blood of Christ is not going to cover a sin. When you know it's a sin, you won't do your part in repenting of it. You die lost if that happens. God doesn't want that. God loves us. God wants us to be pure. He wants the church to be pure. He wants each one of us working on one another to keep us in harmony with God's will. But we live in a very wicked world. And too many times the wickedness of this world works on some members and it overtakes them. If any man be overtaken in trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you need to obey the truth, we invite you to do that while we stand and sing.